let me go ahead and give a super brief 30 second introduction and uh, and then I think we can get started. Do you want to go ahead and put your slides back up just so yep. we're ready to roll? Awesome. All right. So welcome everyone again to our Thursday astrophysics seminar. Today we're very happy to have Ekta Patel from Berkeley. Ekta did her bachelor's at NYU and her PhD at the University of Arizona working with Gertina Besla. And she's now a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. And we're very happy to have her today to uh, present us the seminar. And then we'll also hold a discussion, a group discussion with anyone who wants to join at 2 p.m. this afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so with that, we're here to hear about dynamics of local group satellite galaxies in the era of precision astrometry. Please take it away. Thanks, Susan. Um, and thanks all for uh, having me today and for choosing to spend the next hour of this virtual reality with me. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about the dynamics of local group satellite galaxies in the era of precision astrometry. Um, so much of what I'll be talking about today was um, part of my thesis uh, and then some projects that I've continued as a Miller Fellow at Berkeley. Um, so I'd just like to start by explaining a little bit of what you're seeing in this movie here, which is showing you the orbits of a subset of the Milky Way satellite galaxies over the last uh, three and a half billion years or about a redshift of 0 0.3 to today. And this movie includes the orbits of some of the faintest known stellar systems that we know of um, in our local galactic neighborhood. And some of the information that we need to get here in terms of observations are measurements like line of sight velocities, proper motions, as well as distances. And so what I hope to convey to you by the end of this talk is that these recent measurements and especially um, some of the high precision ones are really helping to change our view of the local group's dynamical history um, and even our understanding of its future fate, which I won't focus so much on today. Um, and this population of faint dwarf galaxies that we're learning quite, quite frankly more and more about at quite a rapid pace um, can help us understand uh, uh, quite a few areas and open questions in astrophysics. So for those of you who don't uh, think about the local group quite often, I just want to give a brief tour um, since this will be the, the laboratory which most of my talk is based on. So we have our Milky Way galaxy and our nearby um, massive spiral galaxy friend Andromeda that are separated by about 770 kiloparsecs. Um, and I've sort of crudely drawn on the extents of the dark matter halos of the two galaxies um, in these white circles. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Okay. Um, and I've drawn these on, which they're, they're not to scale with the galactic disks shown here, um, but just really to emphasize that the dark matter halos of these two galaxies um, uh, are quite broad in extent to the point that they might be overlapping to some degree. Um, and so that's a, a relevant piece of this uh, work. Um, in addition to these two main galaxies, we have uh, the dozens of satellite galaxies that we know to be orbiting around both the Milky Way and Andromeda. And then finally, the sort of third uh, main contributor to the local group galaxies um, are these isolated dwarf galaxies that are sort of in the outskirts of the local group. They don't necessarily um, show evidence for being gravitationally bound to either the Milky Way or Andromeda. So this is sort of the landscape of what we know of as a local group today. Um, this image, as it's just an illustration, does not include um, the full set of satellite galaxies that we know to be orbiting around Milky Way and Andromeda. But what I think is quite fun and, and why this field has been um, a really interesting one to work in for the last six or seven years is that most of the satellite galaxies shown here, and even some that are not shown here, um, were discovered in just the last 20 years or so. So if we look at the historical timeline of when the Milky Way satellite galaxies were discovered, you'll see that this has been a really booming field. So here I'm showing on the x-axis the year of discovery of these satellite galaxies um, compared to the cumulative number. And I've gone ahead and colored each of these points um, by their absolute magnitudes as well. So you can get a sense of um, how faint we've been uh, probing in recent years especially. So in the bottom left down here, we have the Magellanic Clouds, which while my timeline only goes back to the year 1900, um, the Magellanic Clouds have been known to human civilizations across the Southern Hemisphere um, for many, many hundreds of years, dating back to, I think, uh, the ninth century in literature. Um, moving into the 1940s, all the way up to the early 2000s, there were the discoveries of what we tend to refer to as the classical Milky Way satellites. These are dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Um, and all of these satellite galaxies were discovered in photographic surveys. 
Then in the early 2000s, with the advent of digital surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey, these numbers have completely just skyrocketed. So in between the years 2000 and 2010, the number of known satellites already doubled. And then again, in the last 10 years from 2010 to now, the satellite numbers have doubled yet again around the Milky Way. Um, so these numbers are just continuously rising. Uh, this plot I actually made back in 2019 when I was finishing my PhD, and it goes up to about 52 satellite galaxies. And even this is already slightly out of date in that we know of a few more satellite galaxies that have been confirmed as true satellites of the Milky Way. And there's even another handful um, that, are, that are being considered as uh, candidate Milky Way satellites that need a little bit more follow-up to um, truly figure out whether they're, they're satellite galaxies or globular clusters or something else. Um, so we've been learning uh, at quite a rapid pace in this area, and uh, these, this plethora of satellite galaxies give us, gives us quite a large statistical sample to work with. The properties of these satellite galaxies are also quite diverse um, and span a, span a broad range. So specifically, when we look at the masses of these satellite galaxies, this starts to become very clear. So again, on the bottom left, we have the Magellanic Clouds, which you tend to refer to as the bright dwarfs. They have stellar masses of about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. And then moving into this uh, middle range, the intermediate range where the classical satellite galaxies sit, these tend to have stellar masses in the range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. And then at the very faint end, where it's difficult to even see these galaxies in the images I'm showing here, these ultra faint dwarf galaxies have stellar masses um, at most at 10 to the 5 solar masses, um, and some are even known to have just 100 solar masses worth of stars. So already you can see that there's a sixth order of magnitude um, range in stellar mass. And uh, there's also a similar spread in the physical sizes of these galaxies. Um, so at the Magellanic cloud scale, the half-light radii of these galaxies are of order a kiloparsec. And all the way down to the ultra-faint dwarf satellites, the half-light radii are just a few tens of parsecs. So again, there's another three orders of magnitude in size. So knowing that there's a broad range of masses and sizes across this entire sample of satellite galaxies, becomes very relevant to the type of or orbital modeling I'll be discussing um, in much of this talk. So these satellites are distributed all across the northern and southern sky. A majority of them were found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which are the points shown in blue. A handful were also discovered in pan stars. And then your eyes are probably drawn to this region in the south here, um, which are the satellites that were discovered in the Dark Energy Survey, which and the Dark Energy Survey's footprint is quite centered around the small and large Magellanic Cloud, which are shown here. Um, so this is the current picture of satellites and their properties around the Milky Way. And when we look out into the universe, we also see satellite systems around other Milky Way mass galaxies, but often in those systems we're limited to absolute magnitudes of about minus seven or so. Similarly, we can turn to predictions and ask how many satellites should we expect to see given the current census of observed satellites around the Milky Way. So here again, I'm showing on the x-axis absolute magnitude. If you um, compare to the previous plots I showed, this goes down to even fainter absolute magnitude ranges all the way down to um, zero. Uh, and this black line is again showing the cumulative luminosity function of Milky Way satellite galaxies um, reaching up to about 60. And what I'm adding on in this peach shaded region um, is a nice compilation that was presented in some work by Ethan Nadler earlier this year, um, where this is showing the, the statistics from cosmological zoom in simulations of Milky Way like environments. So it's essentially um, subhalo uh, counting abundance techniques. So we have a couple uh, raised hands, uh, can Roman and then Shani. Hi, I have a question about sort of uh, terminology. So uh, two slides back, you mentioned that some of these uh, galaxies uh, are containing uh, something like, you know, 100 uh, solar masses, uh, basically yeah. stars. So why do we call them galaxies? Why are we are not calling them stellar associations or something? Do we know that they have uh, much larger amounts of dark matter, for example? Yes. So these galaxies, um, they, their properties are showing that they're over 90% dominated by dark matter. So that's, that's pretty much the delineation right now. But I think this is a really interesting question overall in that as we have LSST coming online in the next few years, um, it's really going to start pushing the boundaries of, you know, what is a galaxy? What's maybe, like you said, another type of stellar association? But for these ones in particular, um, things like their velocity dispersions are showing that they do um, seem to have a lot of dark matter in them, and that's kind of what we're calling them galaxies. Thanks. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious, uh, what's the up-to-date estimation of uh, how many more um, dwarf galaxies we're gonna detect, you know, given that all of the surveys are not, you know, fully uniform, uh, and also they don't cover necessarily the entire sky. I, I know that there is a paper, you know, kind of old paper by Eric Kolera doing that, but uh, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, do you have, like, how many more are we going to find? That um, is my next build on the slide. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Are there other ones? Because I can't see the chat right now. So, Susan, oh, please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Um, great. So, uh, yes, this peach region is showing the statistics from cosmological zoom-in simulations. Um, and purely due to res resolution limitations, um, these predictions can really only get, go down to absolute magnitudes of about minus six. Um, but generally, the, the observations and the um, statistics from simulations are, you know, roughly in agreement down to this um, resolution limit. And then, as Shini was asking, um, there are also other methods that have been presented in the literature recently, um, where in this one in particular, what's been done is that um, an observational selection function, which by which I mean there's a mapping between satellite properties such as size and luminosity, location, where they were detected and what footprints. Um, and you can take that information and correct it for the volume weighted area and make a prediction for if you did a whole sky uniform survey, how many satellite galaxies would you expect to see? So hopefully this answers your question, Shani, but um, this gray line is showing those predictions all the way down to these faintest absolute magnitudes. So very quickly, you can see that there is quite a large gap between what we currently know and what we expect to see. So the ex expectations are there might be 200 satellite galaxies around the Milky Way down to these very faint magnitudes. Um, and the hope is that current and upcoming instruments will be able to start to fill in some of that observational and theoretical gap. So specifically with the Subaru Hypersu Prime Cam, as well as the Rubin Observatory, um, they will extend these current searches for faint satellites around the Milky Way, and I expect that these numbers, again, will just keep rising into the next decade or two. Um, so there's not only an abundance of faint low mass galaxies in the local neighborhood, but dwarf galaxies in general are also the most abundant class of galaxies in the universe. So studying these galaxies locally is really the best way to improve our understanding of low mass galaxy formation, and specifically to look at how environment affects the evolution of these galaxies. So I like this illustration, um, which is showing the evolution of a dwarf satellite whose main body is represented here in this orange circle. And it's clearly in the midst of disrupting um, as it spirals into its host galaxy, leaving behind this stellar stream. And of course, we see um, dozens of stellar streams out, out in the Milky Way's halo. Um, and not only do these snapshots, snapshots of this, these types of processes help build our intuition for the late stage of um, low mass galaxy evolution, but it's through multiple of these merger events that satellites also contribute to the assembly history of their host galaxies. So there's two, two different ways that we can study um, these populations, both as individual galaxies uh, and how they contribute to the, the galaxies that they're um, orbiting around. We have another question from Rowan. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about the previous uh, plot that you showed. Uh, yeah, this one. So. Yeah, this one. Uh, so it looks like uh, we have over discovered uh, the brighter galaxies from this plot compared to the expectations from, you know, Dark Energy Survey and uh, PanStars 1. Mm -hmm. that m is my understanding correct here? Uh, I don't know if I would agree that it's over observed necessarily. Um, I think that- I mean, the know, numbers are bigger, right? Yeah, they're bigger, but we're looking at, you know, one, two. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be too concerned about, you know, one or two bright satellites um, being higher than, than what's predicted. The other uh, important piece is that, and much of what I'll talk about next, is that uh, these, these two most massive brightest galaxies are the Magellanic Clouds, which have just recently entered into the Milky Way's halo. So it's also a um, potentially a sort of timing effect, right, in that these satellite galaxies are entering halos at different times. And so, you know, Milky Way is in a very unique snapshot of time right now. Um, and so I think that's that's another important piece to consider there. If, if you're using uh, dark energy survey uh, uh, for calibration, then it, in what magnitude range uh, is this calibration sort of uh, valid? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know off the top of my head right now, but um, given that these are based on uh, satellites that were discovered within the dark energy survey footprint, um, uh, yeah, I would say that these are probably pretty, take, have taken that into account. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back to you. Okay, 
so more broadly, there's multiple areas of, um, of astrophysics that can be studied with these low mass satellite galaxies, aside from just, you know, building our understanding of how low mass galaxy evolution proceeds in the, in the galactic neighborhood. So um, some of these include uh, building a further understanding of the nature of dark matter and the different um, mo models of dark matter that can be constrained with these. Um, observations of ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So, for example, in certain dark matter, uh, warm dark matter models, um, one would not expect to see many of these ultra faint dwarf galaxies. Um, low mass galaxies are also uh, some of the oldest galaxies in the universe. So, there are star formation histories and code processes that drive quenching and imprints of reionization. And so, they give us a window into uh, conditions in the early universe. Um, and then these low mass galaxies overall are also key players in some of these small scale challenges that you might be familiar with that we've um, identified in Lambda CDM over the last few decades, um, including the core cost problem and missing satellites and too big to fail. Um, and of course, when you have a large population of these low mass galaxies, you can start to really ask the question of whether these are true tensions in Lambda CDM or whether as we learn more information about more and more of these satellite galaxies, by including um, baryonic physics and other uh, interactions, such as interactions between these satellites and the Milky Way's disk, whether these tensions can be alleviated and, and potentially um, eliminated altogether. But uh, one solution to addressing all of this fundamental physics is knowing where these satellite galaxies were at the various um, major epochs in their lifetimes. And so that's where we can use the dynamics of satellites to rewind orbits backwards and trace back how they inform our picture of the local group as we see it today. So going back to the schematic of the local group, um, in addition to the instantaneous properties, such as where, you know, where these satellite galaxies are located and some of their internal properties, we also have 60 phase space information for more than 50 of the Milky Way satellite galaxies and for four of Andromeda satellite galaxies. So by 60 phase space, I'm saying, I'm referring to the fact that we have um, a, a derivation of a 3D position and 3D velocity vector for each of these satellite galaxies. Um, which are based on observational measurements like proper motion and line of sight velocity, um, with which we can rewind these orbits backwards um, and understand uh, where, these, where these satellite galaxies came from spatially. So quickly, I just want to review um, how we arrive at the 6D phase space information since it involves a few different moving parts. So very simply, if you're an observer looking at a star in some satellite galaxy, you might know the distance that satellite um, using deep CMDs and the tip of the red giant branch method, and you can go out and measure a spectrum and get a line of sight velocity. If you additionally have the ability to track the motion of that star over time through, do, through two different epochs of imaging um, with references like background references such as uh, distant background galaxies or quasars, you can then derive a proper motion, which is the angle, the change in angle across the sky um, over time. And this proper motion in combination with distance gives you a transverse velocity. And so altogether, when you combine this information, rather than just knowing the 1D kinematics of how these satellite galaxies are moving towards and away from you, like you get from line of sight velocity, you're able to build a full three-dimensional um, vector for how these satellite galaxies are moving relative to us. To do this, you need baselines of about three years to get um, uh, pretty accurate measurements for satellite galaxies within the Milky Way's um, halo. But what, as you move further out to, for example, satellites around the Andromeda galaxy, your time baseline between these two epochs of imaging quickly rises to almost a decade. So I show a realistic example of the first uh, proper motion measurement of the Andromeda galaxy. And so this will be an animation that zooms in into this blue field of stars, which are stars within the Andromeda galaxy, though they look quite separated from the disk. Um, and you'll see the, the drifting of these stars over time, which is what I'm referring to as proper motion here. So the brightest white points are the stars within Andromeda, the year is 2012. And you can see they're drifting with respect to these background galaxies and quasars that are um, fairly constant in the reference frame. And if you notice, the time in the bottom right has climbed up very quickly to a unrealistic year of, of approximately 26,000. So these measurements are extremely small. And I think it's quite amazing that we've been able to figure out how to use the current technology like the Hubble Space Telescope to measure these, these motions that are equivalent to um, micro arc seconds per year um, or a few thousandths of a pixel. So I like to give the analogy that this is like watching human hair grow at the distance of the moon when you're talking about measuring the proper motion of the Andromeda galaxy. So this gives us a whole new area of parameter space to um, look at these satellite galaxies. And in the case of M31, this was a major missing component for studying the M31 um, dynamics in detail in a global sense. 
So looking again at a movie like the one I was showing on my title slide, the 60 phase space information acts as the initial conditions for rewinding the orbits of these satellite galaxies um, to look for, for example, instances of small, small scale clustering um, and to inform how these galaxy luminosity functions that we observe around the Milky Way and M31 and even the LMC um, were shaped over time. So right now, as I said, we only have a majority of this information from Milky Way satellite galaxies, and there's a handful of Andromeda satellite galaxies that have this information available. But again, because of the distance and the time baselines required, it's going to be about a decade until we have um, the, the amount of information we have for the Milky Way for the M31 satellites as well. So for the rest of the talk today, I'll be discussing satellites of satellite galaxies. Um, so I'll focus on these ultra-faint satellites um, from two different perspectives. In the first part, I'll be discussing um, satellite galaxies of the Magellanic Clouds. So we're talking about this sub-satellite regime. Um, and in the second part, I'll be uh, moving to the Andromeda system and focusing specifically on um, M33 or Triangulum, which is the most massive satellite galaxy known to be orbiting around Andromeda. And it's a, sec it's a second subsystem, which we can use to deeply study the smallest scales within hierarchical galaxy formation. So as I've already mentioned, more than 30 new dwarf galaxies have been discovered in the Magellanic region. Some examples are shown here near the large and small Magellanic clouds on the sky. These in particular were discovered in the Dark Energy Survey. Um, thanks to Gaia DR2, we now have this proper motion information for many of those ultra faint dwarfs, um, as well as the classical satellites. The classical satellites in particular, most had pre-existing proper motion measurements, um, but using the Gaia DR2 data to derive these proper motions for the classical satellites gives a uniform method for, um, for, for having these measurements for the whole population of classical satellite galaxies. So with this plethora of observational information, we can then ask, which of these satellite galaxies are dynamical companions of the Magellanic clouds, given that they were discovered in close proximity to the clouds? But first, that requires an understanding of the Magellanic system itself. So we need to understand the orbits of the Magellanic clouds and their masses um, to truly pick out which of these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies um, might have been accreted as a group with the Magellanic clouds. Um, so thanks in part to many recently identified faint substructures, many of which you can see um, if you have good resolution on your monitors right now, um, around the LMC and the SMC, um, our, our idea of how massive the LMC is has been um, changing recently so that the LMC actually appears to be um, more massive than we previously thought, such that it's at almost 10% the mass of the Milky Way overall. So the stellar mass of the LMC is about three times 10 to the nine, which means that using something like abundance matching, you would expect the LMC to reside in a halo of order 10 to the 11 solar masses. So currently the LMC is about 50 kiloparsecs from the Milky Way. You can see that here on the left side where I'm showing the orbital history of the LMC. The x-axis shows look back time, so zero is redshift of today, and the y-axis is the relative distance. So at a distance of 50 kiloparsecs, the LMC is um, highly affected by tides from the Milky Way. But as I've mentioned, the LMC also has an SMC companion which is in a binary orbit with the LMC. So I'm showing this orbit of the uh, SMC about the LMC in red here. Um, so it's a fairly unique system in that the LMC has just completed a recent pericentric passage in just, oops, sorry, in just the last um, 50 million years or so, um, and is on its first infall into the Milky Way's halo. And additionally, it's brought along this SMC mass companion with it. So again, looking to simulations, we can ask how many satellite galaxies we would expect to see around an LMC mass halo. Um, so several people have looked at this over the last decade. And as time has gone on, these numbers have been refined down to there being potentially five to 10 satellites with stellar masses greater than 10 to the four solar masses um, around the LMC. Now, uh, this is a plot on the left from one of these studies where you're seeing stellar mass of the satellites of the LMC. Um, and the, really the main prediction that you can focus on here is this orange line. So if you're able to go to very, very um, low mass satellites, again, down to maybe 100 solar masses worth of stars, you'd expect there to be maybe over a dozen LMC satellite galaxies. But in all of these studies, which have used a variety of methods and simulations to come up with these predictions, the thing that has not necessarily been rigorously accounted for is that this LMC is not an isolated halo and that it does have a binary companion in the form of the SMC. So to overcome this in a paper from earlier this year, we aim to rewind the orbits 
um, of these ultra faint dwarfs that were recently discovered to identify which of those are stable Magellanic satellites. And stable here, I, ju I just, by saying stable, I mean um, dynamically stable. They, they appear to have a shared orbital history with the Magellanic clouds. So the way we do this is we rewind these orbits over the last 6 billion years in a combined Milky Way, LMC, and SMC potential, including um, things like dynamical friction from both the Milky Way and the LMC. So this schematic on the left just shows you that we've included a three component Milky Way, a two component LMC, an extended SMC halo, and we're essentially calculating four body orbits for each of the satellites we're interested in, where all mass masses, where all bodies are um, represented as extended mass distributions. And it's those 3D position and velocity vectors that were derived from pro proper motions and line of sight velocities um, that act as the initial conditions here. So in this work in particular, we focused on five of the classical dwarf seroidals and 13 of these ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So we looked at 18 galaxies in total that have both measured proper motions and radial velocities. And the reason we started with those 18 rather than, for example, the whole set of 50 something that have this information available um, is that the Magellanic clouds themselves are um, appear to be in this uh, plane of satellites that is orbiting around the Milky Way. So this is called the vast polar structure. You're seeing an edge on view where each of these points represents a satellite galaxy and the Milky Way's disk is in the center here. And so there appears to be this coherent rotation amongst about half or not really even half, maybe fewer than half of the Milky Way satellite galaxies. Um, and the Magellanic clouds are within that region. So we simply just narrow the sample down to the 18 that are also within that region to start with. So here's an example of what results from this orbital model. And this is one for uh, the Draco 2 galaxy, which is one of the ultra faint dwarfs. So again, I'm showing an orbit like I showed earlier, where you see look back time on the x-axis and galactocentric distance on the y-axis. And this is the orbit that results for Draco 2 if you only include the gravitational influence of the Milky Way alone. And what I want to illustrate to you is that add, as you add in the LMC and the SMC's gravitational influence, you actually get quite different set of orbital histories. So let's take a look at what happens when you add in the LMC's gravitational influence on top of the Milky Way. You get a quite different orbital history. And so um, you don't see this recent pericenter at four giga years ago anymore. There's an apocenter instead at around four giga years ago. Um, so clearly a satellite that's as massive as maybe 10% of the Milky Way um, is, is important to include in the orbits of these ultra faint dwarfs whose halo masses are modeled as about 10 to the nine solar masses. If you further add in the SMC, the orbit again changes, though not quite as substantially as the LMC, which is expected since the mass of the SMC is, um, again, about 10% the mass of the LMC. So there's multiple uh, one to 10 mass ratios here between the LMC and SMC and the LMC and the Milky Way. We've also looked at uh, a couple of different Milky Way mass models. Um, of course, because we're, we're not quite sure, certain exactly what the mass of the Milky Way is, and that is an important parameter to vary in these types of modeling. So if we looked at a, a slightly higher Milky Way mass instead of just 10 to the 12 solar masses, if we bump that up to 1.5 times 10 to the 12, again, you do get quite a different set of orbital histories. But we can do this for the whole sample of dwarf galaxies that we're interested in to really look at which ones might be associated to the Magellanic clouds now that we've included their dynamical impact on these orbits. So here I'm showing a gallery of orbits for the 13 ultra faint dwarfs that we looked at as potential Magellanic companions. And I don't want you to absorb the information in any of these sub panels individually, but when you look at um, general trends, you see that there's clearly a, a diversity of the types of orbits that you find. Some have orbited around the Milky Way, like this one, multiple times. Um, others appear to be potentially infalling for the first time. But the six that I wanna highlight are these which when you look closely at them, you start to see these interesting perturbations in these orbits. So here you see this, these sort of bumps and wiggles um, within the, the orbital history shown here, which you're not seeing in the ones that are not highlighted in green boxes. So these six satellites have been proposed to be Magellanic satellites um, through different methods by other groups. Um, and this is already hinting at that this, this indeed does seem to be the case, that these are affected by the um, gravity of the LMC and the SMC. Um, and so this uh, gallery of orbits I'm showing here does not include the observational uncertainties on the orbits. So you're essentially seeing just six potential solutions within the measured phase space for these satellite galaxies. But of course, it is important to include those uncertainties, especially for the ultra faint dwarfs, where the proper motions are good, but they do still have um, some significant uncertainty that's important to include. So if we look at the summary statistics of these orbital histories, after calculating them many thousands of times to fold in the uncertainties on the proper motions and the, and the line of sight velocities and distances, 
we can look at um, the orbital properties calculated with respect to the LMC now to then identify which ones are really Magellanic companions. So here now I'm showing on the x-axis um, the distance achieved at the last pericenter for these satellites for the full sample of 18. And the y-axis is the velocity achieved at pericenter. Again, all of these are calculated with respect to the LMC, not the Milky Way as I was showing in previous um, plots. So by eye, you can probably already see that these points are sort of separated into three different groups. So let's look at that a little bit closer. If I add on where the tidal radius of the LMC is, we can quickly separate out which of these satellite galaxies are purely Milky Way satellites that don't appear to be orbiting very closely within the tidal radius of the LMC and therefore aren't very um, gravitationally influenced by the LMC's um, halo. So these points on the right are just identified as Milky Way satellites. They don't seem to evidence any sort of dynamical um, uh, evidence for being an LMC satellite. Now on the left, there's still two further subgroups that we can divide. So if I add on the escape velocity curve of the LMC, we can further see that these naturally separate out from each other. So the ones in the top left are what we're calling Milky Way satellites that recently interacted with the LMC. So the LMC has recently entered the Milky Way's halo. These ultrafaint dwarfs are also orbiting around the Milky Way's halo. And by chance, some of these satellite galaxies are going to pass closely by one another, um, but that does not necessarily mean that they're completely um, dynamically associated. So what's happening with this subgroup up here is that they've quickly uh, passed by the LMC at close distances, however, at very high speeds, so at speeds in excess of 350 kilometers a second, meaning that they're, not, they're likely not gravitationally bound to the LMC. So we're then left with this small sample of uh, satellite galaxies in the bottom left, which have had pericentric passages within the LMC's tidal radius and evidence velocities that suggest that they're bound to the LMC's halo as well. So these are the six LMC satellites that we're identifying. And even within that, because we have the orbital histories over the last six billion years, um, we can also separate out which of these have had just one pericentric passage around the LMC, as opposed to those that have completed multiple pericentric passages around the LMC. So overall, the numbers that we're finding, there's about three to six satellites within the Milky Way's halo that seem to be acc accreted with the Magellanic clouds into the halo of the Milky Way. And this is consistent with cosmological expectations. So again, going back to this movie I showed on my title slide, you're looking at the orbits of these 18 satellite galaxies we looked at. And if you focus right here, you can see the LMC and the SMC's orbit in white. And the six pink lines around, intertwined around the LMC and SMC's orbit are these Magellanic satellites that we're claiming um, were accreted as a group into the halo of the Milky Way, along with the Magellanic clouds. <clears throat> so going one step further, looking ahead, we can also take our understanding of the Milky Way substructures um, a little bit more in depth by looking at the evolution of the Milky Way's halo in response to the passage of the LMC over the last two good years. So as I've been saying, the LMC is almost 10% the mass of the Milky Way, meaning that as it enters the LMC's halo, as is shown in this red line here, um, it's going to uh, induce a response in the whole halo of the Milky Way. So this is some work that was done by Nico Garavito Camargo at the University of Arizona, where he ran these very high resolution tailored simulations of the Milky Way and LMC to quantify the effect of the LMC on the halo of the Milky Way, um, the entire halo of the Milky Way, not just the, the regions close to the LMC. And what he's finding is that the LMC results in this transient wake behind the LMC's orbit, as well as this collective response. So these curves are showing you densities where these blue regions are showing you um, over densities and the yellow contours are the under densities, um, where this all started in an equilibrium Milky Way halo. And this LMC, as it comes in, um, distorts the Milky Way's halo uh, to, to quite large distances all the way out to the virial radius. So looking ahead, what we'll be able to do is include the effects of this transient wake and the collective response, as well as include um, all of the mass loss that the LMC experiences as it's come into the Milky Way's halo. Um, as well as the debris that comes off of the LMC and the SMC on top of that. So we'll be able to really fully account for um, all of these different physical mechanisms and masses um, that will be uh, important to include for really accurately understanding the orbital histories of these satellite galaxies. So that's what we have to look forward to next. Um, however, in the local group, the LMC is not the only satellite that can, could potentially host a population of satellites in the local group and have such global effects on its host halo. So for the rest of today's talk, I'm going to switch over to the Andromeda system and I'll focus specifically on um, M33, the most massive satellite galaxy in the Andromeda halo. 
um, which is shown here. And this image on the right is from the PANDA survey, the Pan Andromeda Archaeological Survey, um, which is responsible for um, helping to identify many of the currently known satellites in the Andromeda halo, as well as um, tens of globular clusters and substructures, um, many of which are identified here. So all these black points are, are new satellite galaxies that were discovered within this region. It's the deepest and widest survey in the M31, M33 region conducted to date. So it's uh, illuminated quite a bit of the, the global halo around M31 and M33. We have a question from Rowan. Yes, go ahead. I have a question about this uh, entourage of uh, satellites of sure. uh, LMC. So uh, if LMC and SMC are sort of, you know, it's not one to one, of course, mass ratio, but you know, it's uh, not uh, one to a thousand. Uh, I would be uh, sort of curious to know how stable this system of satellites around such a big uh, binary, because, you know, if we were talking about point masses, then uh, this probably would be a pretty unstable configuration and uh, these guys would be kicked out uh, from the system. So if you integrate backwards for like 10 billion years, I mean, is this system stable or there could be some issues uh, with it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... We, we tend not to integrate back to 10 giga years because we're not including, you know, effects of large scale structure, for example. Um, but your point is still relevant regardless. Um, yes, it's possible that the SMC as it's interacting with the LMC um, would maybe lead to some satellites being ejected from the system. It's also not uh, entirely clear and, and you can maybe see it in the animation I was showing that all of the um, satellites that we, we are claiming are members of the system um, that they all originated from the same sort of spatial location. So yeah, that's absolutely sort of a next step in understanding the system in more detail. Because we included just a static halo of the LMC and the SMC, and it didn't include that mass loss um, for the results that I showed you, uh, we, we couldn't exactly do that test in detail, but that's that's essentially this next step that we'll be able to do with the types of simulations that um, that account for not just the Milky Way halo response, but the mass loss of the LMC and then adding in the SMC interaction over time. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, okay. So, all right. Okay. Uh, so the M33, M33 is the most massive satellite in the Andromeda system. Um, and in addition to all of the uh, satellite galaxies and globular clusters and stellar substructures discovered within this PANDAS footprint, um, another interesting feature around M33 was also um, brought to light through the PANDA survey which is that M33 um, appears to have this stellar debris in the outskirts of its disk, uh, reaching all the way out to almost 30 kiloparsecs away from the main body of M33. Um, so that's an important uh, new feature that was identified just about a decade ago. So uh, keep that in mind as I, as I continue to uh, compare and contrast the M30, M33 and the LMC. So similar to the LMC, M33 has a stellar mass just above that of the LMC by a little bit. Uh, so also roughly three times 10 to the nine solar masses, which means it too should reside in a halo of order 10 to the 11 solar masses. Um, in, in terms of its distance relative to M31, it's 200 kiloparsecs away from M31, so nearly four times the distance between the Milky Way and the LMC. Um, but for this reason, I like to think of it as sort of an isolated LMC counterpart. Isolated is loosely used here, here, of course, because it's still a satellite galaxy within the Andromeda halo, um, but it does not have this SMC mass companion. So as the question that was just asked, um, it provides a little bit of a cleaner system of a massive satellite galaxy orbiting around a more massive Milky Way-like galaxy to which we can look at populations of satellites um, around the satellite. Um, proper motions from M33 were also measured uh, in the early 2000s using a slightly different techniques based on water masers. Um, and related to that stellar debris I was showing you in my previous slide, there's been hints of previous interactions um, through the morphology that we've, that we've discovered in the outskirts of M33 stellar and gaseous disk. So if you look at the H1 around M33, there's also an S-shaped warp and these warps uh, reach out to almost 22 kiloparsecs. So in both the stars and the gas in the outskirts of M33's disk, there's this distorted morphology hinting that there must have been some kind of previous interaction that helped to induce this morphology um, in, in the outer M33 um, disks. So given that those morphological features, especially the stellar debris were just identified in 2009, um, another group within the PANDA survey went out to try to reproduce what type of orbital history is required to come about that, that type of morphology in the outskirts of M33 that wasn't previously known. So the orbit that was presented at the time was based on a set of n-body simulations 
Um, and given that these results came out in 2009, it was actually prior to when a proper motion was measured for M31, meaning that we didn't know how M33 and M31 were moving relative to one another in full three-dimensional space. And so uh, in their simulations, they essentially um, looked at a broad range of potential velocity vectors between the two galaxies. And this is the orbit that results in the morphology that they were trying to target. So this orbit is one where M33 starts on the far side of M31 and has a pericentric passage at about three giga years ago at a distance as close as 55 kiloparsecs, passes through epicenter and arrives at its position today at 200 kiloparsecs away. So essentially the, the goal at the time was which orbit reproduces this, or, this morphology and this was the one that was presented. Fast forward a few years, M31's proper motion was measured. And so then we have a rigorous idea of how these two galaxies are moving relative to one another in full three-dimensional space. And with that information, we can then apply a similar technique to what was done with the Magellanic satellites, where we can look at what orbits are allowed within the measured phase space of these two galaxies. So here we integrated again, many thousands of orbits backwards in time, accounting for all the um, observational uncertainties and parameters like proper motion and velocities. Uh, and we also varied the masses of both M33 and M31. And overwhelmingly what we found is that this orbit that is required to achieve the morphology observed around M33 um, is actually quite hard to come by. So within the thousands of orbits that we integrated, here are some of the results that we found. So if you focus just on the gold lines first, these are the results using um, proper motions measured with HST and the VLBA. And a majority of our orbits supported this gold solid, solid line, where M33 is only entering the halo of M31 for the very first time. So it's on first and fall like the Large Magellanic Cloud is. Um, we also found another possible orbital solution, where there was a pericentric passage almost six giga years ago and at a distance of 100 kiloparsecs. So still not quite matching what's necessary to achieve this morphology. So the overall summary was that in less than 1% of the orbits that we calculated, varying masses, varying um, the, uh, including all the uncertainties on the observed quantities, less than 1% of those orbits were able to match what seemed to be necessary to reproduce the morphology in the stellar disk of M33. We also repeated this experiment a couple of years later because we had independent proper motions from Gaia DR2 um, for both the Milky Way, uh, for, sorry, for both M31 and M33. And again, we found similar orbital solutions, which are the ones shown in magenta here, where Gaia DR2 proper motions unanimously pointed to a first infall of, for M33. So this means that M33 appears to have only likely recently entered M31's halo for the very first time in the last few bil uh, billion years, meaning that this does not answer this original question of how M33 came to have this morphology in both the outer H1 disk and the outer stellar disk. So this is where potentially the second example of the satellites of satellites hierarchy, like I was talking about around the Magellanic Clouds, emerges, where through minor mergers and flyby interactions um, with a hidden population of M33 satellites, they might have helped to, to produce this morphology that we're observing today. So going back to this PANDA survey, which observed a 50 kiloparsec region around M33, this is approximately just 40% of the virial volume around M33. And in that survey, one candidate satellite galaxy was found. And the reason it's a candidate is that we only have 1D kinematics. So we just know its line of sight velocity, which isn't enough information to figure out whether it's a satellite of M33 or of M31. And it's likely that really to understand where the full population of M33 satellite galaxies are, we would need to be looking at a region more like uh, extending more um, extending out to more like 100 kiloparsecs, and we would expect 90% of the satellite galaxies to reside within this area. So simply because we haven't been able to observe this region to the depths required to find galaxies in the ultrafaint regime, we haven't found many of these satellite galaxies yet. But going to Lambda CDM simulations, we do expect there to be um, at least a handful of these satellite galaxies, just as we found around the Magellanic Clouds. So these predictions um, and the, the evidence for why we should look out to 100 kiloparsecs instead um, were reported in a paper from 2018 where I quantified um, these statistics by adopting a technique where we use abundance matching models and a reionization model and apply that to a set of dark matter only simulations. In this case, we use the caterpillar simulations um, to determine the number of luminous satellites one would expect around an M33 mass halo. And here's what we find. So on the x-axis, you're looking at limiting magnitude again, absolute magnitude. The top x-axis shows the stellar mass. 
And here are the expectations for the numbers of satellites one would expect around M33. So first, let's just focus on this blue line, which is giving you the predictions for satellites expected within that 50 kiloparsecs region that the PANDA survey encompassed. So one would expect down to their um, faintest objects that were identified, something like two plus or minus two. We're talking about very small number of statistics. Given that there's one candidate satellite galaxy identified, I'd say that's fairly consistent. The gray curve is showing the number of satellites expected within the full virial volume around M33. So again, if you go down to the depth of pandas, you would expect maybe a handful of satellite galaxies within the virial volume. Um, and of course, if you go to deeper and deeper magnitudes, those numbers just continue to increase. And this orange curve is showing the results for that 100 kiloparsec region. So this is where 90% of the satellite galaxies might reside. And essentially, rather than looking in the full virial volume, which extends out to 150 kiloparsecs, you should be able to capture and reveal most of the satellites expected to be around M33 by just shrinking your survey size to about 100 kiloparsecs. So M33 is expected to host about eight plus or minus four satellites with stellar masses of about 10 to the four or more. So the next step, of course, would be to go out and look for these because we don't have coverage in the regions necessary to um, complete this, this survey out to 100 kiloparsecs where some of those satellites might be. So here are some uh, statistics for what that would require to be able to measure or rather survey this area in this orange annulus um, around M33's halo. So from the ground, uh, you would need something like a week's worth of observations on wide field imagers like the Hyper Supreme Cam on the Subaru telescope, which if you are familiar with Hyper Supreme Cam is not easy to come by. Um, from space in the future with the Roman Space Telescope, one could survey this entire region in something like four hours. Um, that doesn't include overheads. Nevertheless, it's an impressive difference from the Hyper Supreme Cam numbers. Um, and in the meantime, what we're doing is actually working with Shani um, at Princeton and the Dragonfly team is that we're using the Dragonfly telephoto array to survey parts of this region and hopefully find some unresolved structures in M33's halo that we could then follow up. And if we're lucky, identify as satellite galaxies around M33. Um, so here is my summary. Um, I'll go through it quickly. A handful of recently discovered ultrafaint dwarfs seem to be dynamical companions of the Magellanic clouds, providing evidence that they were accreted as a group. Um, M33 is similarly predicted to host another handful of satellites of its own if it's on first infall and we need future observations to be able to really um, reveal where those satellites are. And in general, a census of the satellite populations around the LMC and M33, plus um, some surveys of analogous systems beyond the local group that people are, are um, conducting at the moment, provide a direct test of these small-scale lambda CDM predictions. So these low mass satellites pave the way towards a better understanding of how, how the faint end of the cumulative luminosity function of the Milky Way and M31 were shaped overall. So I'm gonna skip the slide and just go to what we have to look forward to in the local group and beyond. So this is my last slide. Um, so of course, from the ground, we have uh, the Subaru telescope and the Hyper Supreme Cam and the upcoming room at observatory um, from the ground that will really help illuminate more satellites around the Milky Way and M31 and even um, uh, it, around galaxies just beyond the local group. From space, Hubble and Gaia have been giving us um, a plethora of information on under, to help us understand the motions of these galaxies as well as their star formation histories. Um, and it will be uh, about 10 years until we have the proper motions for many of the M31 um, dwarf galaxies, which require baselines of about eight to 12 um, years. And those will hopefully be followed up with JWST and that's where we'll get the proper motions from. The Roman Space Telescope will also help in identifying some of these satellites and potentially with um, helping to measure proper motions as well. And then finally, a handful of ultra, ultra faint satellites have been discovered around galaxies at three to four megaparsecs away, like Sene and M81. Um, but to really uh, hone in on the dynamics of the satellites in those systems, we'll need 12 to 16 meter class telescopes in space um, and multi decade time baselines to measure the proper motions of those satellite galaxies. Uh, so it's important that we really use the information we have locally to understand how we can leverage this um, astrometric information to learn about the galactic neighborhood. So I'll stop there and I'll take more questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, pretend you're here. Uproarious applause. Um, we have time for some questions. I think you can raise your hand or just feel free to jump in at this point. I have one question is what 
are will Gaia DR3, you know, have have a big immediate impact or or not so much? Not so much is a short answer. Um, it will it will help with some of the satellites um, that have the largest proper motion uncertainties. Uh, but those are the ones that tend to be on first infall and at least the very recent orbital history that indicates the first infall, that part of the orbit is pretty well constrained. So it, it won't have such a huge uh, influence now, but by the end of the Gaia mission, those that data will be helpful because that time baseline will be longer. So back to not, not being an expert here, I'm just curious to know what, what do we know about the persistence of warps? I mean, could it be that M33 has been, it, but anyway, if you can, can comment on that, I'm wondering. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, you know, we see warps when we look out into the universe and in, in galaxies all the time. So it's not that it's a, a, an uncommon phenomena, but I think what sparked the interest in, in M33 is that because it is around another massive galaxy, um, the, you know, the natural hypothesis was, hypothesis was that there should have been a tidal interaction to induce that type of morphology. So um, yeah, the warp itself is not super uncommon, uh, but I think, you know, there's, there's evidence that uh, warps can be caused by tidal interactions. And for that reason, I think it's, uh, you know, interesting to try to figure out whether that's the case in the system and what, what that might mean in terms of either M31 or other low mass galaxies that have helped to induce that. Okay, I suppose I meant more in the direction of um, the, the persistence of the warp, how long lived. Um, ah, these warps. Sorry, yes. Um, I, let's see. I don't think we know how long lived the warp itself is. Uh, in order for it to be explained by a um, close interaction with M31 and like three billion years ago, um, I think that time scale would be expected for that warp to still persist to today. But uh, if you remember one of the orbital solutions I showed that we were finding though, it wasn't the most common one statistically was that there was a pericentric passage about 6 billion years ago at a distance of hundred kiloparsecs. And so maybe at the 6 billion year range, I'm not sure that the warp would still persist all the way until today. So I think it's, you know, a few, a few billion year time scale would be reasonable. Uh, but I think to really understand whether um, this is, this is, probable, we would need some a better understanding of a simulation. So uh, there might be some information in the PANDAS paper with these n-body simulations, but I'd have to look back for them. And that was, uh, that was trying to reproduce the morphology of just the stellar warp or also information right. change one? Okay. No, there was no gas in that simulation. So it was just for, just for trying to reproduce the stellar warp. Does that give you any additional handle on the time scale or the, the transients of this? Yeah, um, you mean the H1 in particular, if it was added? Or whatever would be most useful. But I'd, yeah, I'd... I think, you know, certainly trying to fit both of those together and, and seeing whether they do persist over three or five or six billion years, I think would be um, a, a useful constraint. Conversely, you know, if M33 did get as close as, let's say, 50 kiloparsecs, which is required to produce um, the, the stellar warp, um, you would expect to see effects like ram pressure, like truncation from ram pressure in the gas, and you don't observe that. So I guess in, in the sense of what is missing from the observations, the H1 is helpful to add that constraint in that if there was that close passage, you might expect to see some signature of it in the H1, which we don't actually observe. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that reminds me of my other question. Is there, is there any additional useful information from like star formation histories in any of these? Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of two, two, two bodies of evidence that can support really either orbital history at the moment. Um, so the global star formation history of M33 and M31 both show um, peaks in star formation about two to four giga years ago, which would be consistent with this potential tidal interaction between the two galaxies. Um, on the other hand, um, that's that alone, you know, if you if you compare and contrast the things that do agree with the, the close pericentric passage and the things that are potentially absent, if it really is on first infall, I think they kind of balance each other out. Another thing you might expect to see is a bar in 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 M33 and M33 doesn't have a bar. Um, so there's sort of different morphological features that point to yes and no. Uh, and so that's kind of why I'm, I'm torn in the middle, but 
uh, purely from the, you know, what's possible within the face space, the first and fall seems more likely. On the other hand, if you start to compare it to some of the other um, physical properties like you're talking about, then, you know, both can still sort of be um, reasonable. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What about the galaxies that you've identified as, as candidate satellites of, of the Magellanic Clouds? What do we know about their star formation histories? Yeah, that's actually some work that's in progress right now. So um, this is work that Alana Sachi is doing, um, who just recently moved to Italy from Space Telescope. Um, one of the problems with those ultra faint dwarfs is because they have such few stars, you, you, it's really hard to derive a precise star formation history for each individual galaxy. So what they're, do they're doing is stacking and trying to um, derive the star formation histories, for example, for the Magellanic group, and then for the non-Magellanic related satellites or at least you know, splitting them in different ways. And so um, I believe the preliminary result that she found is that the ones that seem to be associated to the clouds um, quench slightly earlier than the ones that don't appear to be um, associated with the clouds. So there might be some evidence for like group pre-processing happening there. But all of them look to, to not have ongoing star formation yeah, none of them have, nope, none of them have ongoing star formation. Most of them quenched way back at reionization times. All right, if we have any last questions, uh, now is the time, but otherwise I think it's good to continue the, the discussion at uh, 2 p.m. our time. So thank you so much again, Ekta, this was great.